lecture two of the nominations and campaign. So we'll uh, continue to look at um, the road to the presidency uh, here in the United States. Now, just a little bit of review. Remember that primaries are elections in which voters choose the nominee or delegates pledged to the, no pledged to the nominee. Now, that said, don't get the state primaries confused with the national primaries. Um, state primaries uh, nominate people for state offices. Um, the national primaries in the states nominate the candidates that, that are being um, uh, that are being proposed by all the parties, and that can that can include the Greens, the Libertarians, or or whatever. Also, remember that the Progressive Era was the was kind of the um, the laboratory for um, trying out uh, new forms of um, the democracy. There was a frustration with uh, the caucus system, which was rife with uh, corruption, <clears throat> as it was run by the parties. Uh, and so the reforms of the progressive era bring us direct primary elections, which is what we have today. We've varied a little, a little bit with closed open blanket jungle. Um, Nonpartisan elections at the state and local level, um, civil service expansion, uh, which in a sense helps um, conduct the elections, uh, the initiative, the referendum recall, which allow us to make adjustments as voters. Initiative is bottom up, referendum is top down, recall <clears throat> is removing people that we don't think should be in office anymore. And then the 17th Amendment was. Um, the provision uh, allowing um, all the states to elect their senators directly. <clears throat> that comes through in 1913. Now, most states use the primaries, um, the primary systems. Again, some of the states use the caucus systems. When you're using the primary systems, um, you can even have a situation in which one party is using a closed system, the other party is using is using an open system. We saw that here in California, where the Republicans had a closed primary system. The Democrats had an open primary system allowing uh, independents like me to vote in their primary. I voted for Hillary Clinton that year. <clears throat> Blanket primary, which um, the courts declared unconstitutional uh, in 2003, though where blanket primaries exist, there hasn't been much in the way of challenging that because the new kid on the block is the jungle primary, um, which I like. Uh, it, it simply means that uh, everybody is thrown into the primary election, no matter what party, no matter how many members of your party are running, and the top two finishers then run for uh, that office in the general election. I, I happen to like it. Uh, so here in our assembly district, we had a Democrat and a Republican running for assembly. We didn't have a state senate election this year, but certainly for Congress, we had two Republicans running, Steve Knight and, uh, uh, I forgot who the other guy was, but Steve Knight won. <clears throat> now, many primaries, um, the problem we've seen, of course, as we saw from lecture one, the primaries are jockeying to become the earliest, uh, which unfortunately is lengthening the primary season it's causing the front-loading problem that, uh, that we see, and um, it's causing a mashup at the front of the line. So we know that New Hampshire is first, is the first primary, Iowa is the first caucus, and then there's boom, 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 boom right after that. Um, I don't see either of those, because remember New Hampshire has a law which says they have to be the first primary. I don't see any of those going into the previous year, but hey, Stranger things have happened, right? And remember that these that these primaries generally serve as elimination contests. So the Iowa caucuses may eliminate one or two candidates. The New Hampshire primary may eliminate one or two more candidates. <clears throat> That's a good thing. Not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, you hate to see people lose that you like, but it uh, not everybody can win. Excuse me there. Um, now the nomination. It uh, runs from the very beginning of the year now uh, through July. And the goal of any candidate is to accumulate enough delegates to win the nomination. 
That is the only goal. Now the thing is, if they do this early, which many of them have done by March, let's say, um, the convention that will follow will basically be a formality. And the last time that that didn't happen perhaps was 2008, in which Barack Obama was probably going to win, but uh, Hillary Clinton had quite a few delegates uh, stacked up. And so once you know you've won the nomination, or you will win the nomination, unless you do something really stupid, the emphasis of how you run your campaign changes. Now the focus is even more uh, looking like you can be, you should be, and you will be the president. You give off that error, that, that inevitable error of being able to fill the requirements of the office. It's no longer about ratification, it's all about image. <clears throat> now, once you get to the convention, um, the first thing that happens is, you know, everybody arrives, it's a party atmosphere. The first thing that they really tackle are the, uh, are the party platforms. And the problem for anybody running uh, for either party is that the party platform is generally out of the mainstream of the American center. So the Democrats lean too far to the left, Republicans lean too far to the right, and you have to lean either left or right in order to win your party's nomination. But then you have to scurry back to the middle in order to win the general election. And then you can, of course, be accused of flip-flopping on... on uh, on different issues because you said one thing to your party's faithful but now you've got to say something else to voters so they're always walking this this kind of fine line <clears throat> now once the platform is done and then there's speakers that are doing another giving another speech number of speeches on different things uh, probably a third night is the official uh, nomination and actually may sometimes it does come the same night as the speech given by the vice president President, presidential candidate. The roll call of states will occur um, most of the time, The especially if, let's say, the candidate comes from California. California will, um, will pass on giving their, uh, on giving their, their vote. It will, all the other states will, will go, and then when it is apparent that um, the candidate will win the nomination, when his or her state reports their results, they pass back to the home state of the candidate and then they will announce it and the balloons fall off the ceiling and the confetti flies and all of that stuff and you sit there and you yawn and go, well, big deal. Um, some of you might say even something else. <clears throat> now, before, before the convention starts, sometimes long before, but usually within the week of the convention starting, the presidential candidate makes it known who he wants or she wants to run uh, as their vice presidential nominee. And the nominee for vice president is chosen by the presidential nominee. It's uh, a decision that's rubber stamped by the convention and usually by the power brokers. And there's a, there's a goal, usually, because some of the candidates we've seen in recent decades have changed that that uh, uh, that focus. Um, and what we're talking about is balancing the ticket. Usually, balancing the ticket means if you have someone from the south, get someone from the north. If you have someone from the east, the vice presidential candidate should be from the west, <clears throat> so that so that those areas of the country feel like they are important. But in 1992, Bill Clinton chose. Uh, who's from Arkansas, chose Al Gore, who's from uh, uh, Tennessee, which is right across the Mississippi River from Arkansas. And um, that was an interesting choice. Uh, George W. Bush chose Dick Cheney from Texas and Wyoming. Um, Barack Obama, Illinois, chose Joe Biden um, from Delaware. So sometimes there's an attempt to balance the ticket. Sometimes it isn't. Then there's always this overlying theme. There are lots of losers. If you're if you were like the Republicans in 2012 or the Republicans in 2008 or the Democrats in 2004, there were a lot of people who ran, and there are probably some sore losers who are perhaps second guessing their the way they ran their campaign or or anything like that. But now it's not about all about them. It's all about 
presidential candidate. And you have to show that your party has, has reconciled their differences and is unified behind the candidate who will lead them to victory or defeat in, uh, in November. And they have to do this by the end of the convention. There's a couple of ways of showing that. Um, now remember, the speakers have no power. You're going to see lots of speakers if you watch the gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage, which the major networks, 2, 4, and 7, or ABC, CBS, NBC, no longer do. They let the, uh, the, the news channels, CNN, Fox, Fox News, and uh, MSNBC do the gavel-to-gavel. -gavel. Because what's happened is that since the 1980s, the viewership has declined. It used to be that, that a presidential candidate's speech would get big numbers, big, big numbers, but not so much anymore. Not so much anymore. Uh, uh, the, uh, the drama is gone because in many cases everybody knows who the candidate was going to be for that party since March or April when, the, when they won a majority of delegates in the primaries. So there's no surprise, there's no drama, there's nothing. So why tune in and watch? Um, so this is more for the party now than, uh, than it used to be where there really was a lot of public consumption. Um, it's not for the party. It's the way for the party to get organized. It's the way the party get motivated for November. Um, the vice presidential nominee will give a speech uh, the night before the convention closes. The presidential nominee comes in the next night and gives their closing speech. Everybody holds hands and sings Kumbaya, and the, the, again the balloons fall, and the confetti flies, and the, and the standards move up and down, and everybody's like happy, and then you no know, reality sets in. So let's look at a little bit of a video that uh, kind of covers the conventions. Come on, you can do it. There we are. There's a lot of party that goes on. There's some really mind-numbing business that goes on. So it's a little bit business, and it's a whole lot of show. These party conventions are two different animals, really. The first is to do the business of the conventions, which is get a nominee out there. Yes, we all know who it's going to be, but they have to do that. That's under the party rules and the way they've set it and, and how it all works. They've got to go and they've got to vote. So that's the official business. The rest of it is about putting on a face that voters will get an idea of who this candidate is and, and what this party is about. The fact of the matter is these are important for these candidates, whether you're the president, or the challenger to say, this is what I'm about. The party is presenting itself, be they Republicans or Democrats, to the general public. Number one, it, it, it helps excite their base, the people who are gonna vote anyway, or who might say, oh, it's too cold, it's too hot, I'm not going to the polls. Uh, so it's about their base, but it's also about that minuscule number of swing voters that are still trying to figure out who they're gonna vote for. Delegates are chosen depending on the state, either through a caucus. Sometimes they are picked at state party conventions. Generally what happens is a delegate runs in a primary and they say, I'm Matt Smith and I want to be a delegate for Mitt Romney. And if they win, they go and cast their vote for Mitt Romney. Now there are other delegates that also show up and those are state party leaders, just really the activists. Uh, very often elected officials, senators, congressmen, governors, whoever the nominee wants to speak. That's the simplest answer. Now, it's more complicated, of course. Sometimes the party wants to show diversity. Uh, this is completely true of uh, Republicans who are very sensitive to being party of uh, the white male. But you will see folks um, of color or females, anyone is seen as a minority, to show the viewing audience that this is not just a party for certain kinds of people. The Democrats do the exact same thing. The second of all used to showcase up-and-comers. It shows who the party wants to first of all generate excitement, but also to be seen as, oh yeah, I remember that guy. But some of it is paid by you guys. What happens inside those arenas? 
is paid for by taxpayer money, but not all taxpayers. You know that little box that's on um, your tax returns that says, would you like to contribute to a political party fund? That's that money. And then uh, each party has a, a committee that has raised money to put on, you know, whatever they can't buy uh, for the amount of money that they're going to get from, from taxpayers. I mean, it's a lot. I mean, that's a, it's a fairly small amount, believe it or not, that's paid for um, by direct taxpayer money. Okay, that was Candy Crowley, who is a... Uh... Announced, just announced that she's leaving CNN after 27 years, after I think uh, today. Um, that's a pretty spiffy uh, little um, segment on the importance or the lack of importance of conventions and how they kind of work. So what's right and what's wrong with our presidential nominating systems? Well, when we look at the pro, they're highly participatory. If you're talking about party members, they're highly representative of the type of people that belong to that party, and they do weed out the weaker candidates. And sometimes, you saw in that <clears throat> Democratic primary video from Lecture 1, that nobody showed up for Biden, nobody showed up for Dodd, nobody showed up for Gravel. Well, yeah, there's a reason for that. Um, they didn't have much in the way of support. And so, after Iowa, they were done. After, you know, Dodd moved there, he spent two years campaigning. Um, and apparently, nobody showing up at any of the Democratic precincts for Dodd meant that he didn't waste his time, I guess, but he wasn't the man uh, that voters thought should be in the job, and they chose someone else. The cons outweigh the pros, though. We know that when we look at the turnouts for... Uh, uh, for primaries, uh, they can be rather low. And if one party uh, has a president who's an incumbent who's running for re-election, their turnout for the primaries for that party are going to be really low. I mean, why turn out? You already know uh, the president is going to get uh, renominated, so why turn out? Um, and if the decision has already been made in the other party, Really, there's no incentive for going out unless there's some state ballot issues or something like that. Also, you know, England's England's uh, parliamentary election period is uh, five weeks. Ours is when you factor in the invisible primary, which, by the way, has been going on uh, for a number of months to the final caucus. We're looking at two plus years. Can you imagine a presidential candidate just being exhausted by the time they get to that point? And now, the toughest job on the planet is uh, in their sights for four to eight years. Boy, uh, I wouldn't want the job. It also doesn't test the, the candidates for the qualities needed as president. Um, I think the, considering many of the people who have won and kind of been successful um, may not have been ready for prime time, but we were taken in by the lofty speeches or the charisma or whatever, and then look what happens. And then front-loading, of course, has adversely affected the states with later primaries. That's why California moved theirs from June to March. They felt, here we are, the biggest state in the union, and we contribute virtually nothing to the nomination of um, either party's candidate. So we want in on the fun, and they moved it to early March. Not sure that's uh, meant anything, uh, even doing that. Now, we know that voters in primaries tend to be better educated, and they tend to be more affluent than those in general elections, simply because you're, you're, there is a connection between those who are motivated uh, on e either side of the party uh, and your ability to think that you can make changes. The general, Generally, the man on the street doesn't necessarily think that they can have an effect, but someone who um, plays in party politics certainly does, which is why the voters tend to have a different... Um, a different makeup in, in the in the primaries. So we know then that the delegates elected in primaries and caucuses tend to be unrepresentative. Um, they tend to be more ideological. They tend to be more activist, better educated, less moderate, more wealthy. And if you're in the Democratic Party, you tend to be a union member. In fact, I think I've seen statistical data where um, over half of, of well over half of everybody attending the convention is union. 
And many, many, many of those, far greater than the percentage of themselves in the population, many of them are teachers. <clears throat> now you know what's wrong with our profession. And I didn't mean that. Well, yeah, I kind of did, but never mind. Um, so what we get is a select group, a, a select strata of voters with certain attributes um, generating the type of money and the type of electoral support which puts into the candidacy their type of candidate. So a selectorate replaces the electorate. Um, so again, it's unrepresentative. And of course, money plays a huge role. There's a reason that the invisible primary is going on two, two and a half years before the next election. It's, it's, it's expensive. You've got to run uh, a national campaign before you even run a national campaign if you do win the, the, the nomination. And there isn't any public financing available. So money's huge. And if you can't raise the money, then you might as well go home. But that also takes out some very, very good candidates. And of course, the current system gives too much power to the media. They're more concerned about who's, who's ahead, who's behind. And they're not talking much about the issues. They're talking about why they're ahead or why they're behind, in addition to who's ahead and who's behind. But they're not really talking about the issues in, in a deep and meaningful way. So then, the rest of it's pretty easy. The fall campaign starts around Labor Day and goes until the first Tuesday of November, unless that first Tuesday is the first of November, and then it's the, the second Tuesday, which is... Uh, which of course is election day. Sometime in December, the winning slate of electors, whichever candidate, presidential candidate, won your state, the winning state of electors which represent that candidate meets in the capital city of their state and they, they formally cast their electoral votes, which are then relayed to Congress, which formally counts those votes and then formally makes an election announcement in December which, of course, we already know who's won um, based on election day statistics, unless it's the year 2000. And uh, the presidential candidate acknowledges that he or she is now the uh, formally on the road to being president of the United States, and they go on their merry way, choosing their cabinet and doing things like that. So the last five steps stretch basically from Labor Day to January 20th, which is Inauguration Day. And... That's about all of the nomination process that you need to know. Now, when we look at our next lecture, which is three, it's going to be short, I promise, because, hey, it's about George McGovern and the Democrats and the debacle of 1972 and, the, and, and reform. Um, though I think that reform has ultimately kind of worked out, uh, and there's a reason for that, and I think it's uh, that, that, that term that you've seen before, superdelegates. Uh, but that's going to be three. And then four, we tackle campaign finance. Oh, I know that's going to be so much fun. Uh, so until the next time, this is the end of lecture two.